Hi, Chris Potts here. This is the third in our series of screencasts on quantifier properties. Part one reviewed some core concepts and some hopefully not too controversial determiner meanings. And part two was focused on lexical uncertainty and context dependence. For this screencast, we're gonna switch gears yet again. We're gonna do a deep dive on the meaning of determiner most, as in most students. Now, my goal for doing this is first and foremost to better understand what determiner most means. However, I also want to reinforce the notion that these are empirical matters. We're using tools from logic and math, and that can make it feel like the meanings we propose are set in stone, when in fact these are all empirical claims we're making, and so we could easily find data that tell us that we're wrong about our core proposals. So let me begin this story with some observations that were made by Mark Lieberman, the chief blogger at Language Log. Uh, the exchange that caught Lieberman's eye is in 19. Uh, this, the interview is with the novelist John Irving. Uh, the interviewer, Kurt Anderson, says, I read somewhere that you said that now most of your audience, you believe, reads you not in English. They're not only overseas, but people in the United Kingdom or Australia. And John Irving cut in. He said, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say most, but I'd say more than half. Sure, more than half, definitely. This response is noteworthy for us because the meaning of most that I put in our semantic grammar defines most as truth conditionally synonymous with more than half. So on that treatment, John Irving may as well have said, I wouldn't say more than half, but I'd say more than half, right? His utterance would be contradictory. So what's going on? Uh, was our original analysis incorrect? Lieberman said he was originally on our side. He said, I think I always took most to mean exactly more than half. So Irving's, I wouldn't say most, but I'd say more than half, took me aback. Now, lots of readers left comments on Lieberman's post. Uh, the first two responses here might be carving out some space beyond truth conditions. The first one says, I think most licenses a default generalization relative to a bunch of pragmatic factors. So that perspective might allow that most means more than half in its truth conditions, but maybe most brings more to the table beyond truth conditions, as it were. The next comment is sort of similar. I think most has a normative or qualitative sense in addition to a quantitative sense. So maybe we could do justice to that idea in our pragmatic theory. But then these next few comments seem to say directly that we were wrong to assume that most starts to be true just past 50%, right? The first one says 60 to 75%, and it expresses a few other claims about different determiners. The second one says something similar, two-thirds as the boundary marker. And the final comment I included here in 25 is the only one in this little sample that seems to side with us. It says, most has always meant more than half, but less than all to me. Now, I do want to take issue with the uh, but less than all part. Uh, I want to claim that that's a pragmatic inference as well, um, but we'll set that aside for now. In this kind of context, I think it's a good policy to see what dictionaries say, since they're generally smart about usage and meaning distinctions. However, you can see that they struggle to articulate the meanings of these words since they don't have a language of compositional semantics to do it. So I don't personally find these phrases all that useful, right? Modifying a plural count noun, the greatest number of, the majority of, that's from the OED, uh, the majority of from Merriam-Webster. The American heritage, heritage definition isn't about determiner most, but rather the most that appears as a modifier in phrases like the most votes. And I wouldn't want to assume that, that, that the two words are the same there, so I would set that aside. And in any case, none of these descriptions really helps me understand the truth about most. So let's consider some theories of our own using our framework for defining determiner meanings. The meaning in H is the more than half meaning that I originally proposed, and I've given it in two essentially equivalent formulations. The first is an explicit proportion statement, and the second says that the A's that are B's outnumber the A's that are not B's. The second one is the one that you see in the Keenan article in his 4F, and I'd say these two formulations are identical except where A has no entities in it. In that case, the division in the first version would be undefined due to a divide by zero cardinality problem, whereas the second would come out straightforwardly false. 
So we can mostly set that aside, although the issue of what happens when the restriction to a determiner is empty is an interesting one that we'll try to understand through the lens of our pragmatic theory later in the quarter. In GH, we have a version that's meaningfully different yet again. This is perhaps what the language log commenters were proposing. It's a context-dependent meaning because it has this free variable k in it. And we just say that as a matter of informal loose convention, people expect k to be way larger than 50%. So there's still vagueness, but with this loose constraint on what's possible or reasonable. So the vagueness is kind of constrained. So these are all in principle reasonable looking theories, and there may be others we could consider. The question is what evidence can we bring to bear on this issue? Lieberman began with a corpus study using the web. He simply searched for most star percent, where the star is a wild card that search engines like Google will fill in with a word or perhaps a short phrase. And this histogram here shows his results aggregated. And you can see that, as Lieberman says, it's pretty clear that the whole range from 50.1 to 99.9 .9 is getting some action. I myself decided to build on what Lieberman did with the web, but using a more controlled corpus. I use the GigaWord corpus, which is a pretty large collection of news stories. And I too saw a wide range of percentages given. In my data, we see values as low as 53% and as high as 96%. And the majority of examples seem to be closer to 50% than would be predicted by some of the intuitions and theories that were given by commenters above. Now, my data don't contain an actual 100% case, but I have this closely related one from James Collins. It involves majority of. The example he found says, the rape case was the only offense for which the majority of participants supported registration. In fact, 100% supported the registry in this condition. So in this case, it was 100%, but you can see why they had to say the majority of, right? If they had said, the rape case was the only offense for which all participants, it would have left open whether there were lots of other cases that would have passed the majority threshold. So they had to say majority to establish the stronger claim, and then they gave the 100% information to add on to that. I think this example would be fine if we used most participants instead of the majority of participants, and so that's a little bit of evidence that most is consistent with all, even though in general, in most situations, if you can say all, oh, you shouldn't choose the weaker form most. That's a pragmatic interaction. One quirk of my data is that there are actually three examples where the percentage cited is below 50%. For example, in 30, we have most homes, 39%, have a separate room where the PC is. Now, my hypothesis is that in these cases, there is an implicit restriction at work here. For example, I bet that in 30, we first restricted to cases where the home contained a computer at all, and within that group, more than 50% were probably uh, in a separate room. But they only had stats for the full set of homes surveyed, and so they gave us that stat, which was 39%. I might be wrong, but otherwise I think these examples are very confusing to me. So I'm going to stick with that theory for now. One final note about Lieberman's post, he ended it with a lot of nice citations to work on most. So if you're contemplating possibly maybe doing something in this area for a final project, do check out what he lists there. I can't remember precisely, but that may have been where I first learned about the paper I want to touch on next, Petrovsky, Litz, Hunter, and Halberta, The Meaning of Most, Semantics, Numerosity, and Psychology. One of their experiments was the inspiration, let's say, for the in-class experiment we did with items that look like those in the figure that you see here. I find this paper really interesting and provocative. On my reading, they're sort of assuming that our more than half meaning is essentially correct, and they're wondering about how that theory is actually implemented in a kind of computational theory of the mind. That is, we can, we can ask, what verification strategies do people use for these sentences? And what can they tell us about their knowledge of language in Jackendorf's sense? Or in our terms, what function do people actually run when they use the determiner most? For these authors, they propose that speakers actually calculate and then compare the cardinalities of two sets using what they call an approximate number system. That is, we don't evaluate these claims via explicit counting, 
but rather by using more fundamental methods for approximate comparisons of the magnitudes of different sets of objects. One of their modes of testing this was very much like our in-class experiment, but it was done in the lab. So they presented people with displays like these, but just for 200 milliseconds. And they asked them to say yes or no to brief statements like most of the dots are blue. Now they chose 200 milliseconds because it should be fast enough for people to reliably register the visual scene, but it's too fast for people to actually count in any exact way. So you have to fall back on some kind of more approximate, more basic um, estimation strategy. So let's go on to their findings. As you might expect, the rate of correct responses goes down as the ratio of yellow to blue dots gets smaller. Of course, we should keep in mind that correct here might be too strong. This is the sense in which they seem to be assuming that the more than half analysis is correct, right? Some of these correct labels might be actually disputed by the language log commentators that I cited earlier. However, even if we set that aside, we can see that accuracy goes way up for all the ratios for experimental conditions in which the display allows for some fast comparison strategies like the aligned ones that you see here. For example, the highest accuracy ones are the column pairs sorted items, like this last display here. And even where the ratio is very close, as in this example, almost everyone says most dots are yellow is true. So that's support in a way for the more than half analysis. It's like saying if we strip away all aspects of communication and just focus on the fast judgments that people are making about truth, we seem to see evidence for our hypothesis H. And our in-class experiment corroborates these findings. Recall that I read a sentence while displaying it, then showed a display for three seconds, and then we went to a rest screen where you did your actual evaluation. So for example, when we did this first item here, it was like, I said, question one, some of the dots are blue. Now, I had to show the display for much longer than 200 seconds to account for lags in the network and so forth, so it might be that some of you could do some actual counting, and that would obviously be a big problem for the paper's hypotheses about the approximate number system. But I think it doesn't compromise our primary goal of seeing what people do when the percentages are near 50%. So let's move on to the items from the experiment. Uh, some dots are blue seems very systematic. Most dots are yellow is more mixed, consistent with what we'd expect for this complex and muddled display. A dot is yellow, no surprises there, it's false and essentially everyone saw that. Same for every dot is yellow, people spotted the blue dot it seems. So that's reassuring about the display mode here. Uh, a dot is blue, I thought we might see some interference between the singular a dot and the abundance of blue dots, but it seems like that didn't really get in the way of people saying true for this item. Next we have our second difficult to parse display. This one should be a bit easier than item two because you can see that most of the blue and yellow dots are paired up with just a few lonely yellow dots. So if you focus on the lonely ones, you can make a fast judgment. Still, I'm surprised that the rate of true, dare I say correct responses, is so high for this case. Next we have two sort of cool down items. No dots are blue is clearly false and most dots are blue is clearly true. And finally, we have two critical items. Uh, this is perhaps a somewhat easy one. Uh, you can tell at a glance that there are more yellow dots than blue ones, so that's reassuring. And finally, we have a case where an approximate verification strategy is very easy to formulate. The lonely yellows at the bottom of this display led everyone to say most dots are yellow was true. So overall, we have some evidence for two things. First, it looks like we do employ some faster than counting strategies for verifying the truth of these sentences. That's very interesting and could illuminate uh, the sort of mental representations or verification strategies that we bring to bear on these sentences. Second, it looks like when we strip away all the pragmatics and just ask for fast intuitions about truth, the more than half hypothesis for most appears to be correct. There may be pragmatic factors that lead people to make other assumptions in context, but those assumptions are likely building on this conventional truth conditional core. I don't wanna go so far as to say that we've settled this matter regarding most, but I do think we have a clearer picture now. 
And hopefully also we've seen some techniques that you can imagine adapting to other questions about other determiners, which could be the starting point for an original project for you.